Hello, it's Jason Heath here with Contra Race Conversations, the beginning of year 12. 12, what? I can't believe that. It's been that long. Hope you're having a fabulous start of 2018 or whenever you're listening to this. And this is another experiment. I like to change things up, especially at the beginning of the new year and try some different formats and that sort of thing. And I thought that every once in a while I would drop in with a solo show about could be what I've learned doing the podcast or in this particular phase of doing the podcast could be about some greater life lesson could be about some base geekery of that sort of thing. Obviously, I've done this before if you've listened for a while and I'll do it every month, couple months, something like that, just sort of depending on that season of life. Speaking of seasons of life, I thought it would be interesting to talk about something that I've been thinking a lot about recently namely the Pareto Principle. I'm not sure if you're familiar. Obviously, how would I know if you're familiar? But let me describe what the Pareto Principle is. It is that, or it states that for many events, roughly 80% of the effects come from 20% of the causes. Okay, so think about that. 80% of effects come from 20% of the causes. This is something that I have absolutely noticed in my own life, and I've been thinking a lot about it these last couple years now that I've moved out to San Francisco and sort of rebooted my career. I'd like to give a shout out also before we get going here to our sponsors. We've got four great sponsors, a little more on them later, but we have Upton Bass, D'Addario Strings, Robertson and Sons, Violins, and the English Double Bass book. So we'll chat about them in a bit. But I want to talk about this concept of the Pareto Principle. And I'll share with you a little bit about my story. You may know a lot or very little about me, but I grew up in South Dakota, went to school at Northwestern University in Chicago, and then freelanced in the Chicago area and in the U.S. kind of in general for about seven years. Grew weary of that for a variety of reasons, which I won't go into right now, and decided to go back to school for music education to go teach orchestra. That coincided right with me starting up this podcast and my blog and it got this weird traction, not weird, it got uh, traction in the mid 2000s. And it's been something that I've been doing to a greater or lesser degree ever since. My wife was at the same time going back to school for medicine. She is now in the final stages of her radiology residency out here in San Francisco. Getting hooked up with that in San Francisco precipitated the move. That's why I live in San Francisco now. And I had In that time between starting the podcast and blog and moving to San Francisco, I'd built up a pretty solid education career in the state of Illinois and in suburban Chicago. I was president of Illinois ASTA. I had served on, you name it, for all the typical organizations associated with music education. And my group had just played at the Midwest Clinic, which most of you probably don't know what that is, but that's a major event in instrumental education. And yeah, on paper, kind of a weird time to leave a job like that, but it made total sense because my wife got a job in San Francisco. Now I'm here, very happy, and I wiped the slate clean with this move. You know, you live somewhere for a period of time and you develop different gigs, yearly annual events, different jobs that you do, and even if you have like what I had a full-time job, the the schedule starts to just expand to fill all that extra time. So I was finding myself teaching at DePaul University, which I loved, teaching my high school orchestra job, which was wonderful, but also a whole lot of time, and playing in the Elgin Symphony and doing all sorts of things, and just very, very, very busy. <laughs> very busy. I hate the word busy, but I was busy, busy, busy. And I realized that this was an opportunity, this San Francisco opportunity was, it was my chance to wipe the slate clean and just start over. So I decided on a few things, moving out to San Francisco, having thought about it for a while, I decided to, number one, find a way to work 
the same sort of hours that my wife worked. Whatever work was going to mean for me, I wanted to make it kind of fit into that nine to five, eight to five, Monday through Friday schedule, which by the way, is a challenge if you're a musician because so much of what you do is on the nights and the weekends, right? You're playing gigs, teaching on the weekend maybe, teaching after school, that sort of thing. So I wanted to re- build a career out here in San Francisco that conformed a little more to those hours. Why? So I wouldn't be working when my wife was home. That's not what I want to do long term. So number one, find a way to do something that fit into those hours more or less, or certainly more than it had been in Chicago. Number two, something that was not based in teaching in the schools. And I don't want to go into that too much here, but I built this nice career for myself, satisfying, fun, busy, but that in Chicago, and I was just seeing recreating that out here in San Francisco, most likely with less pay, maybe not as many opportunities, and just sort of thinking as I I was just turning 40 at the time, do I want to be doing that same type of work when I'm 50 and when I'm 60? Maybe not, probably not. So something that's not based around working in the schools or in a full-time basis at any rate. And number three, based around something that I was genuinely passionate about. So I put out this blog post in 2016. I'll link to this here, but it was kind of about what I was hoping would unfold for me in San Francisco. And the funny thing is what has unfolded was basically in that blog post, which is super cool. But something I've learned about, and this is tied into this whole Pareto principle, is learning how to listen to my muse. And we're gonna dig into that next. But I do wanna give a shout out to a couple of our sponsors Upton Bass, they have been with me in some capacity since the mid-2000s, and I've done all sorts of different projects over the years and grown into new areas, and Upton has done the exact same thing, and it has been so fun to follow along with the team at Upton and the innovations that they're doing for the bass, whether it's their car model bass or the removable necks or the different shapes and styles and all the ways that they have continued to innovate to serve the bass community. Can't say enough good things about Gary and Eric and all the other folks at Upton. Highly encourage you to check out what they have to offer at UptonBass.com. Incidentally, they are crushing it online. <laughs> they are In other conversations I've had with, with various folks, they're the people that... that Everybody in the base world points to about just who's just truly nailing it online in in the base world. So, congrats to Upton for that, but especially for what you offer to the base community. UptonBase.com and Diderio Strings, now a long time, over a year sponsor. So, I'd love to give a shout out to Diderio and Sabrina and Lyris. You've heard them both on the podcast in the past. I have used Diderio Strings since I started playing bass. And whether it's Helicores or Zyx, which I've been experimenting with recently, very cool strings that sort of gut sound and response, but without some of the stability issues that you associate with gut. Or whether it's their Kaplan strings, which are my bass right now, and it's nice buttery sound under the bow a nice ringing pizzicato. Uh, They make great strings. They're a friend of the bass for sure. And you can check out what they have available in the string department through a website. Just click through or go to contrabassconversations.com slash strings. So back to the Pareto principle and what I have started to do in terms of listening to my muse. Here's something that I have been doing basically since I moved out here and it works really well. I just notice what I wake up thinking about. What's the first thing on my mind? And I'm a positive person. I usually am thinking about something that's exciting to me, a project that's exciting. So what is that thing that I wake up thinking about? What gets me going? What makes me think, hell yes. And I think that's an important concept we'll talk about in a little bit, but what really gets me going and do more of that (laughs) and less of the other things. So When I moved out here, the honest answer was I had absolutely no idea what 20% of the things I would be doing with my time would produce 80% of the results. I found, whether it's in the school job or freelancing or podcasting or blogging, that that Pareto principle really does apply. You do a whole bunch of things and some things, roughly one in five or 20%, do hit. 
And the only way I'm going to know is to try a whole bunch of different things. And by hitting or connecting, I'm that could be financial, that could be in terms of making an impact, that could be some sort of personal satisfaction. But what really moves the needle for me in the various projects that I do. So I started out with what I knew was hitting, which was the podcast. And I just went all in on the podcast. I've basically been, uh, especially externally, going all in on the podcast as I moved out to here, uh, or out to San Francisco. I, in addition to the podcast, so I have done a whole bunch of projects. I've written a book. I have worked on starting a few different business ventures uh, to greater or lesser degrees of success. I've reached out to a lot of people to greater or lesser degrees of success uh, for a variety of reasons. And I have just tried to follow my instinct and really focus on what was a hell yes. Okay, and so this is a concept. I'm a big Tim Ferriss fan uh, and listen to his podcast. I've read all his books and he's somebody that I, he wrote the four hour work week. You may or may not be familiar with that. And that's easy to sort of dismiss that as possibly a cheesy book or that something along those lines. But I have found him to be such a wise person and really he's taught me and the guests on his show have taught me some really valuable life lessons. So this hell yes comes from Derek Sivers, who's the founder of CD baby. And for him, for Derek, when he looks at a project, it's either he is all in or he's not in. And I think that's so important. Learning how to say no to the things that sound okay so that you can say yes to the really good opportunities. And I look back on the decades at this point of my career, the various careers I've been in, and I have said yes to so many things that I'm Eh, kind of enthusiastic about. And I'll tell you, I'm still doing it. I'm getting better. But I've said yes to a few things that I were not a hell yes. And it happens. Maybe it'll continue to happen for the rest of my life. But I am getting better, I know, at really just going for those things that really get me excited. And part of that is, again, tuning into what I spend my time when I'm not on the clock. What am I thinking about? What am I excited about? Uh, Derek also has another great strategy. I believe it's Derek, definitely shared via Tim Ferriss's podcast. But it is when you're looking at an opportunity, rate it on a scale of one to one to ten, <laughs> but you can't use a seven. Okay, so look at whatever opportunity presents itself, rate it on a scale of one to ten, but seven is not available. That is such a cool way to look at projects because what you'll realize is a lot of the things presented to you are a seven. They're like, meh. Yeah, Sounds pretty good. Yeah, I could do that. Yeah, why not? But but if it's an eight or a nine or a 10, I mean, that you're into that, right? If it's a six or below, ah, it sounds like a good idea. And I have started to do that and really be at least fairly disciplined about that. And I have, I've been able to jettison a few things that were just sort of those eh, uh, somewhat enthusiastic, but were just dragging down my time, my energy, and my focus, and really focus in on the things that I'm really excited about. So in the last uh, less than six months, the last, let's say, four or five months, I've had some really interesting opportunities pop up that have hit that 80-20 principle so well. For example, I have come on board with Eastman Strings, which is a company I have bought their bases for years at various school jobs that I had, and I'd played their bases in different contexts, and through a series of events and connections, they've brought me on board to be their product manager for bases, and I am having such a great time in this role, it's super creative, it, the, the team is great, the wonderful folks, and that has been so interesting to me, and that's something that I've been waking up and thinking about, ooh, what can we do, can we try this, can we do this, and, and so I have had such a great time doing that. I've also been brought on board with the company Musicians Toolkit, I'm on their advisory board, and I'm starting to film video lessons for them and help them uh, get connected more in the music education world. The short description of Musicians toolkit is it's looking to be like Netflix for video lessons of all sorts from pop to uh, clarinet to intermediate double bass to you name it. That has been so cool. And again, another really fun and exciting and creative project. Also, Nicholas Walker brought me on board to help the ISB. So I'm back on the board for the International Society of Bassists and helping 
to think about the next 50 years. Think about strategically, think about how can we really make an impact and connect with people and be an authentically useful organization for the base world here as we move into 2018 and beyond. Super cool. All of these projects are both complex and and the answers aren't clear, but they're really interesting and exciting to me. And also some other opportunities that have popped up, and these are things that are really hitting. It's that that 20% that is really just like both financially and creatively and otherwise, these are the things that are really, really just so exciting to me right now that I've been doing more and more travel and more and more clinics and presenting. And that's only increasing as I look to the future. Now that sort of conflicts <laughs> with the wanting to be home and not working when my wife is off. Uh, so I'm, I'm working on finding a balance between that. And when I'm in San Francisco, really being present, but that has started to take off and has been super fun. In addition, there are another, I won't bore you, but another half dozen of business world opportunities and that sort of thing have popped up. So I had been hoping to do this sort of funky amalgamation of, of projects that tap into my various skill sets and it's happening. So the the challenge is that uh, with with this podcast I've been I've been going all in on the podcast and I am continuing the, the podcast is continuing to truck along and I'm super pumped about the people that I have coming up in terms of interviewing uh, the challenge that I am working on right now is the amount of time it takes to do this podcast it is an extraordinary amount of time and I reached out with an ask in the 2017 best of 2017 episode and I had several people get back to me offering to help. So I'll give you some more details soon, but I've got some people that are more than willing to help with various aspects of this. And it looks like I will be able to pare down the amount of time that I need to be involved. There are certain tasks that I really want my hand in, like for example, doing interviews and doing the research and all that kind of thing. And then recording dialogue at the beginning and the end, but there are so many other steps. And I am going to do an episode on how to do a podcast in a, a week or so here. But a podcast is an example of a project that's made up of probably like 75 steps. So if I could move like 60 of those steps or even 50 or 40 of those steps off of my plate, I think that will help for the sustainability of this podcast. Because what happens with Jason Heath, I have learned, is I... Uh, if, if it gets overwhelming, I just drop it. And that's the last thing I want to have happen with the podcast. I've built up. I think I, and I did bail. If you didn't know this, I did this podcast till 2010, let's say 2009. And then I got busy <laughs> like I'm getting busy now. And I just let it go. Couldn't do it anymore. So 160 episodes. And then I was out for five years or more than, well, not five years, basically. So I don't want that to happen again. The way to not let that happen again is to get people on board to help out with this. I think we're good, but if you are interested in helping out in some capacity, feedback and contra-based conversations, drop me a line and I will uh, let you know if I have something. And it could be a very simple task, but just a way to take some of those 75 steps off of my own personal uh, work day and, and get you involved. And of course, anybody who gets involved, I will give you shout outs and links and credit and all that kind of thing. So I'd like to finish up today by chatting a bit about the sort of schedule I've devised for myself. And of course, I have a bit more flexible time than many people listening have, but hopefully there's some lessons that you can learn for finding ways to maximize your creativity so that you can really, really be effective with the time that you do spend. That 20% of the time you do spend, can you get 80% of the results for whatever project you happen to be doing? I'd like to give a shout out to Robertson & Sons, our sponsor. For more than four decades, Robertson & Sons has been specializing in providing the highest quality string instruments and bows to collectors, professional musicians, music educators, and students of all ages. And they have the most beautiful facility. It has three instrument showrooms and a recital hall. This is a great recital hall. It's available to anybody coming through that wants to try out an instrument. So 
Go to Albuquerque. It's a great town anyway, but even better with a place like Robertson's and try out some bases. They might be from the 1700s. They might be a brand new base by Trevor Davis or another great modern luthier, but they're doing great things and they have amazing, amazing instruments. Robertsonviolins.com and the English double bass book. George and Tom Martin and Martin Lawrence are launching this now in 2018. It's going to be coming out soon and it examines the great English double bass makers of the 18th and 19th centuries, and that illustrates in fine detail the incredible work that they produced. It also explores the fascinating story of how the double bass came to England, its development, guided by Domenico Dragonetti, of course, the great one, and the rise and fall of the English double bass makers. You could pre-order your limited edition copy at www.theenglishdoublebass.com. So we will wrap up here today just with a few thoughts on schedule. And again, I used to have a very busy teaching schedule. So many of you have a similar schedule and I fully understand. And my wife and I don't have kids and I have the luxury of having a lot of my time available to schedule as I wish. I realize how precious that is and most people don't have that, but you can hopefully at least use a few of the things I've discovered again by wiping the slate clean and starting over. So I wake up probably 6 a.m., let's say, here is 6.30, maybe maybe a little earlier, usually not later than that. And these days, I go to the gym right away. I had been in a routine of working for a few hours and then going for a run. And I love that schedule because it sort of gets gets my brain going in a really interesting way and kicks me out of whatever state I was in. And I do a lot of problem solving that way. But what I've discovered as, I be, as my schedule has gotten more filled in is that if I don't work out first thing of the day, I just don't do it. And that's what so many of us run into. Uh, So I'm able to do that. We have a gym right here in the building. I do that and I do not, when I wake up, I do not check email or Facebook Messenger or anything like that. I leave all that stuff shut down for quite a long time, actually. So what I do, I wake up, I go to the gym. And now before or after the gym, I break out, I have an iPad Pro, you can obviously do this on a piece of paper, but I write down three things that I want to get done that day. Three things. And now on the other side, I write down the other like 27 things on my mind. You know, just the, the random monkey mind jumble of, of everything from responding to a specific email to I got to pick up milk to you name it. But I try to put down three things that I want to do. And I try to limit to three. And then I, I use the other side for all the other things. And I will sometimes get into get through some of those. But at the very least, those three things are what I want to do during the day. So it could be podcast, work for Eastman, work for Musicians Toolkit. Or it could be inter- researching interviews or something like that. I, I find that doing a few sustained and uninterrupted blocks really moves me forward in the projects I want to do. Trying to do seven things for 15 minutes results in me never really getting deep and doing deep work. And that's, you know, I sort of discovered this when I was teaching in school, which is kind of amazing that I was able to do some deep work because a school environment is like the opposite of deep work. It's kids running around all the time asking you. It's like nothing but distraction for for an entire day. But I was at least in my school job in the mornings. I would get there early. I'd shut my office door and I would work for maybe 60 minutes on whatever that number one project was. And again, no email, nothing like that. Uh, So I go to the gym come back and I dig into project one. I still haven't checked my email. I work for perhaps 90 minutes to 120 minutes on that project, which puts puts me in around 9 a.m. to 9.30. I will then take a little break, work for another 45 to 60 minutes, And then around 10 a.m. is when I do my first email check of the day. That's when I just open the floodgates and just let it rip and let everything come in. And I find that the longer I delay email in my day, the less time email takes because email is the rest of the world's to-do list for you, right? I mean, that's really true. That's what everybody else wants you to do. Not, and obviously it's a, 
integral part of our day to day, regardless of what you do. I'm sure you spend a chunk of your day on email, but starting your day off with email lands you in the quadrant of what Stephen Covey, the author of The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, in the quadrant of urgent but not important. All those things, hey, Jason, can you do this? Can you do X? Can you do Y? Can you do Z? Those are all the things that, yes, they do need to be done. They are urgent, but ultimately they're not vitally important, probably to long-term success for X, Y, or Z. So I find by waking up and actually working out, with this some, which is something that is not urgent, but important. That's another one of the quadrants. Stephen Covey, I'll put a link to the Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. If you haven't read it, it's a great read, kind of a classic book at this point. But the, the not urgent, but important is the category that I try to start my day off with. That's the, the things that are going to really matter long term, but no one is breathing down my neck to do them. No one is breathing down my neck and telling me to exercise. No one is breathing down my neck and telling me to do research on a guest or to work on one of these complex projects like I was describing. But all those important tasks, those are the things that ultimately make a difference. The other two quadrants are urgent and important. That is, I have been wounded grievously and I need to go to the hospital. Okay, obviously, you drop what you do and you go to that. And the not urgent and not important, that's like all the spam that comes in, that's flipping through Facebook, that's all those other things in life. So how much can you spend your life in the not urgent but important quadrant? Obviously, you have to go into some of the others from time to time. So 10 a.m., that's when I allow the floodgates to open and I just let all that come in. I try to get out of my email as quick as I can um, and, and contact people and do whatever I need to do. And then lunchtime happens. And I usually try throughout the day to go somewhere else. I might start my day at home and then for lunch I go out and then I'll work out. Or I might start my day out and then I go to a different place for lunch and then I come back home. But I find that state change is really helpful for me creatively and just kind of like resetting things. So I eat lunch and then I dig into those other other important tasks. And I have to work quickly because let's say I eat lunch and I'm done around 12.30 or 1. I find by about 3 p.m., my creative juices are running out. I am not being particularly effective. Now, I've worked for several hours on creative, complex tasks. So uh, that's fine. But I find that I try to front load my day with those tasks. If we're thinking about base, what I do if I'm practicing for something is I do try to use some of those 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. hours for base. And anything after that, yes, I can work. Yes, I can get things done. But those hours are best left for tasks that don't require a whole ton of creativity or brain power. That's what I have discovered that seems to really make the most impact for me. I do occasionally have a day where my wife has gone the entire day or I and I, I do want to work that night, but I, I generally try to stop work even if I have no no you know set plans for the evening or whatever. I do try to stop work by the late afternoon. I find that if I work too late into the night, it impacts what I do the next day. And by, fo- it's just like practicing, right? You can get a lot more done usually with two and a half or three hours a day consistently every day than six hours one day and then you're kind of burned out. So you do like three bad hours the next day. Then you do four bad hours. Then you do like one okay hour. I find that less but really focused always wins out. And those are the ways that I try to set my schedule up so that I can really get the maximum impact for what I'm working on. I hope this is helpful and obviously many more base specific talks to come, including next week. We've got some great episodes. We've got Eric Snows on the podcast. We've got oh, Paul Johnson from Peabody coming up on the podcast. We have so many great guests. And thank you so much for listening. We are rounding the corner on 450 episodes. Can't believe that we're getting up into those numbers, but we are. Please, if you haven't subscribed, certainly subscribe to the podcast or share this with a friend, whether or not they're a bass player, and drop me a line, feedback at ContrabassConversations.com. I'd love to hear from you. That's going to do it for today's episode, and we will see you again soon for more life on the low end of the spectrum.